International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. Jean Gourdon's Four Days, Part 1, by Emile Zola. Spring on that particular day at about five o'clock in the morning the sun entered with delightful abruptness into the little room i occupied at the house of my uncle lazar parish priest of the hamlet of durg a broad yellow ray fell upon my closed eyelids and i awoke in light my room which was whitewashed and had deal furniture was full of attractive gaiety i went to the window and gazed at the durance which traced its broad course amidst the dark green verdure of the valley fresh puffs of wind caressed my face and the murmur of the trees and river seemed to call me to them i gently opened my door to get out i had to pass through my uncle's room i proceeded on tiptoe fearing the creaking of my thick boots might awaken the worthy man who was still slumbering with a smiling countenance and i trembled at the sound of the church bell tolling the angelus for some days past my uncle lazar had been following me about everywhere looking sad and annoyed he would perhaps have prevented me going over there to the edge of the river and hiding myself among the willows on the bank so as to watch for babet passing that tall dark girl who had come with the spring but my uncle was sleeping soundly i felt something like remorse in deceiving him and running away in this manner i stayed for an instant and gazed on his calm countenance with its gentle expression enhanced by rest and i recalled to mind with feeling the day when he had come to fetch me in the chilly and deserted home which my mother's funeral was leaving since that day what tenderness what devotedness what good advice he had bestowed on me he had given me his knowledge and his kindness all his intelligence and all his heart i was tempted for a moment to cry out to him get up uncle lazar let us go for a walk together along that path you are so fond of beside the durance you will enjoy the fresh air and morning sun you will see what an appetite you will have on your return and babet who was going down to the river in her light morning gown and whom i should not be able to see my uncle would be there and i would have to lower my eyes it must be so nice under the willows lying flat on one's stomach in the fine grass i felt a languid feeling creeping over me and slowly taking short steps holding my breath i reached the door i went downstairs and began running like a madcap in the delightful warm may morning air the sky was quite white on the horizon with exquisitely delicate blue and pink tints the pale sun seemed like a great silver lamp casting a shower of bright rays into the durance and the broad sluggish river expanding lazily over the red sand extended from one end of the valley to the other like a stream of liquid metal to the west a line of low rugged hills threw slight violet streaks on the pale sky i had been living in this out-of-the-way corner for ten years how often had i kept my uncle lazar waiting to give me my latin lesson the worthy man wanted to make me learned but i was on the other side of the durance ferreting out magpies discovering a hill which i had not yet climbed then on my return there were remonstrances the latin was forgotten my poor uncle scolded me for having torn my trousers and he shuddered when he noticed sometimes that the skin underneath was cut the valley was mine really mine i had conquered it with my legs and i was the real landlord by right of friendship and that bit of river those two leagues of the durance how i loved them 
how well we understood one another when together i knew all the whims of my dear stream its anger its charming ways its different features at each hour of the day when i reached the water's edge on that particular morning i felt something like giddiness at seeing it so gentle and so white it had never looked so gay i slipped rapidly beneath the willows to an open space where a broad patch of sunlight fell on the dark grass there i laid me down on my stomach listening watching the pathway by which babet would come through the branches oh how sound uncle lazare must be sleeping i thought and i extended myself at full length on the moss the sun struck gentle heat into my back whilst my breast buried in the grass was quite cool have you never examined the turf at close quarters with your eyes on the blades of grass whilst i was waiting for babet i pried indiscreetly into a tuft which was really a whole world in my bunch of grass there were streets cross-roads public squares entire cities at the bottom of it i distinguished a great dark patch where the shoots of the previous spring were decaying sadly then slender stalks were growing up stretching out bending into a multitude of elegant forms and producing frail colonnades churches virgin forests i saw two lean insects wandering in the midst of this immensity the poor children were certainly lost for they went from colonnade to colonnade from street to street in an affrighted anxious way it was just at this moment that on raising my eyes i saw babet's white skirts standing out against the dark ground at the top of the pathway i recognized her printed calico gown which was gray with small blue flowers i sunk down deeper in the grass i heard my heart thumping against the earth and almost raising me with slight jerks my breast was burning now i no longer felt the freshness of the dew the young girl came nimbly down the pathway her skirts skimming the ground with a swinging motion that charmed me i saw her at full length quite erect in her proud and happy gracefulness she had no idea i was there behind the willows she walked with a light step she ran without giving a thought to the wind which slightly raised her gown i could distinguish her feet trotting along quickly quickly and a piece of her white stockings which was perhaps as large as one's hand and which made me blush in a manner that was alike sweet and painful oh then i saw nothing else neither the durance nor the willows nor the whiteness of the sky what cared i for the valley it was no longer my sweetheart i was quite indifferent to its joy and its sadness what cared i for my friends the stories and the trees on the hills the river could run away all at once if it liked i would not have regretted it and the spring i did not care a bit about the spring had it borne away the sun that warmed my back its leaves its rays all its may morning i should have remained there in ecstasy gazing at babet running along the pathway and swinging her skirts deliciously for babet had taken the valley's place in my heart babet was the spring i had never spoken to her both of us blushed when we met one another in my uncle lazare's church i could have vowed she detested me she talked on that particular day for a few minutes with the women who were washing the sound of her pearly laughter reached as far as me mingled with the loud voice of the durance then she stooped down to take a little water in the hollow of her hand but the bank was high and babet who was on the point of slipping saved herself by clutching the grass i gave a frightful shudder which made my blood run cold i rose hastily and without feeling ashamed without reddening ran to the young girl she cast a startled look at me then she began to smile i bent down at the risk of falling 
i succeeded in filling my right hand with water by keeping my fingers close together and i presented this new sort of cup to babet asking her to drink the women who were washing laughed babet confused did not dare accept she hesitated and half turned her head away at last she made up her mind and delicately pressed her lips to the tips of my fingers but she had waited too long all the water had run away then she burst out laughing she became a child again and i saw very well that she was making fun of me i was very silly i bent forward again this time i took the water in both hands and hastened to put them to babet's lips she drank and i felt the warm kiss from her mouth run up my arms to my breast which it filled with heat oh how my uncle must sleep i murmured to myself just as i said that i perceived a dark shadow beside me and having turned round i saw my uncle lazare in person a few paces away watching babet and me as if offended his cassock appeared quite white in the sun in his look i saw reproaches which made me feel inclined to cry babet was very much afraid she turned quite red and hurried off stammering thanks monsieur jean i thank you very much as for me wiping my wet hands i stood motionless and confused before my uncle lazare the worthy man with folded arms and bringing back a corner of his cassock watched babet who was running up the pathway without turning her head then when she had disappeared behind the hedges he lowered his eyes to me and i saw his pleasant countenance smile sadly jean he said to me come into the broad walk breakfast is not ready we have half an hour to spare he set out with his rather heavy tread avoiding the tufts of grass wet with dew a part of the bottom of his cassock that was dragging along the ground made a dull crackling sound he held his breviary under his arm but he had forgotten his morning lecture and he advanced dreamily with bowed head and without uttering a word his silence tormented me he was generally so talkative my anxiety increased at every step he had certainly seen me giving babet water to drink what a sight oh lord the young girl laughing and blushing kissed the tips of my fingers whilst i standing on tiptoe stretching out my arms was leaning forward as if to kiss her my action now seemed to me frightfully audacious and all my timidity returned i inquired of myself how i could have dared to have my fingers kissed so sweetly and my uncle lazare who said nothing who continued walking with short steps in front of me without giving a single glance at the old trees he loved he was assuredly preparing a sermon he was only taking me into the broad walk to scold me at his ease it would occupy at least an hour breakfast would get cold and i would be unable to return to the water's edge and dream of the warm burns that babet's lips had left on my hands we were in the broad walk this walk which was wide and short ran beside the river it was shaded by enormous oak trees with trunks lacerated by seams stretching out their great tall branches the fine grass spread like a carpet beneath the trees and the sun riddling the foliage embroidered this carpet with a rosaceous pattern in gold in the distance all around extended raw green meadows my uncle went to the bottom of the walk without altering his step and without turning round once there he stopped and i kept beside him understanding that the terrible moment had arrived the river made a sharp curve a low parapet at the end of the walk formed a sort of terrace this vault of shade opened on a valley of light the country expanded wide before us for several leagues 
the sun was rising in the heavens where the silvery rays of morning had become transformed into a stream of gold blinding floods of light ran from the horizon along the hills and spread out into the plain with the glare of fire after a moment's silence my uncle lazar turned towards me good heavens the sermon i thought and i bowed my head my uncle pointed out the valley to me with an expansive gesture then drawing himself up he said slowly look jean there is the spring the earth is full of joy my boy and i have brought you here opposite this plain of light to show you the first smiles of the young season observe what brilliancy and sweetness warm perfumes rise from the country and pass across our faces like puffs of life he was silent and seemed dreaming i had raised my head astonished breathing at ease my uncle was not preaching it is a beautiful morning he continued a morning of youth your eighteen summers find full enjoyment amidst this verdure which is at most eighteen days old all is great brightness and perfume is it not the broad valley seems to you a delightful place the river is there to give you its freshness the trees to lend you their shade the whole country to speak to you of tenderness the heavens themselves to kiss those horizons that you are searching with hope and desire the spring belongs to fellows of your age it is it that teaches the boys how to give young girls to drink i hung my head again my uncle lazar had certainly seen me an old fellow like me he continued unfortunately knows what trust to place in the charms of spring i my poor jean i love the durance because it waters these meadows and gives life to all the valley i love this young foliage because it proclaims to me the coming of the fruits of summer and autumn i love this sky because it is good to us because its warmth hastens the fecundity of the earth i should have had to tell you this one day or other i prefer telling it you now at this early hour it is spring itself that is giving you the lesson the earth is a vast workshop wherein there is never a slack season observe this flower at our feet to you it is perfume to me it is labor it accomplishes its task by producing its share of life a little black seed which will work in its turn next spring and now search the vast horizon all this joy is but the act of generation if the country be smiling it is because it is beginning the everlasting task again do you hear it now breathing hard full of activity and haste the leaves sigh the flowers are in a hurry the corn grows without pausing all the plants all the herbs are quarrelling as to which shall spring up the quickest and the running water the river comes to assist in the common labor and the young sun which rises in the heavens is entrusted with the duty of enlivening the everlasting task of the laborers at this point my uncle made me look him straight in the face he concluded in these terms jean you hear what your friend the spring says to you he is youth but he is preparing ripe age his bright smile is but the gaiety of labor summer will be powerful autumn bountiful for the spring is singing at this moment while courageously performing its work i looked very stupid i understood my uncle lazar he was positively preaching me a sermon in which he told me i was an idle fellow and that the time had come to work my uncle appeared as much embarrassed as myself after having hesitated for some instants he said slightly stammering jean 
you were wrong not to have come and told me all as you love babet and babet loves you babet loves me i exclaimed my uncle made me an ill-humoured gesture eh allow me to speak i don't want another avowal she owned it to me herself she owned that to you she owned that to you and i suddenly threw my arms round my uncle lazare's neck oh how nice that is i added i had never spoken to her truly she told you that at the confessional didn't she i would never have dared ask her if she loved me and i would never have known anything oh how i thank you my uncle lazare was quite red he felt that he had just committed a blunder he had imagined that this was not my first meeting with the young girl and here he gave me a certainty when as yet i only dared dream of a hope he held his tongue now it was i who spoke with volubility i understand all i continued you are right i must work to win babet but you will see how courageous i shall be ah how good you are my uncle lazare and how well you speak i understand what the spring says i also will have a powerful summer and an autumn of abundance one is well placed here one sees all the valley i am young like it i feel youth within me demanding to accomplish its task my uncle calmed me very good jean he said to me i had long hoped to make a priest of you and i imparted to you my knowledge with that sole aim but what i saw this morning at the waterside compels me to definitely give up my fondest hope it is heaven that disposes of us you will love the almighty in another way you cannot now remain in this village and i only wish you to return when ripened by age and work i have chosen the trade of printer for you your education will serve you one of my friends who is a printer at grenoble is expecting you next monday i felt anxious and i shall come back and marry babet i inquired my uncle smiled imperceptibly and without answering in a direct manner said the remainder is the will of heaven you are heaven and i have faith in your kindness oh uncle see that babet does not forget me i will work for her then my uncle lazare again pointed out to me the valley which the warm golden light was overspreading more and more there is hope he said to me do not be as old as i am jean forget my sermon be as ignorant as this land it does not trouble about the autumn it is all engrossed with the joy of its smile it labors courageously and without a care it hopes and we returned to the parsonage strolling along slowly in the grass which was scorched by the sun and chatting with concern of our approaching separation breakfast was cold as i had foreseen but that did not trouble me much i had tears in my eyes each time i looked at my uncle lazare and at the thought of babet my heart beat fit to choke me i do not remember what i did during the remainder of the day i think i went and lay down under the willows at the riverside my uncle was right the earth was at work on placing my ear to the grass i seemed to hear continual sounds then i dreamed of what my life would be buried in the grass until nightfall i arranged an existence full of labor divided between babet and my uncle lazare the energetic youthfulness of the soil had penetrated my breast which i pressed with force against the common mother and at times i imagined myself to be one of the strong willows that lived around me in the evening i could not dine my uncle no doubt understood the thoughts that were choking me for he feigned not to notice my want of appetite as soon as i was able to rise from the table i hastened to return and breathe the open air outside a fresh breeze rose from the river the dull splashing of which i heard in the distance a soft light fell from the sky the valley expanded peaceful and transparent 
like a dark shoreless ocean there were vague sounds in the air a sort of impassioned tremor like a great flapping of wings passing above my head penetrating perfumes rose with the cool air from the grass i had gone out to see babet i knew she came to the parsonage every night and i went and placed myself in ambush behind a hedge i had got rid of my timidness of the morning i considered it quite natural to be waiting for her there because she loved me and i had to tell her of my departure when i perceived her skirts in the limpid night i advanced noiselessly then i murmured in a low voice babet babet i am here she did not recognize me at first and started with fright when she discovered who it was she seemed still more frightened which very much surprised me it's you monsieur jean she said to me what are you doing there what do you want i was beside her and took her hand you love me fondly do you not i who told you that my uncle lazare she stood there in confusion her hand began to tremble in mine as she was on the point of running away i took her other hand we were face to face in a sort of hollow in the hedge and i felt babet's panting breath running all warm over my face the freshness of the air the rustling silence of the night hung around us i don't know stammered the young girl i never said that his reverence the cure misunderstood for mercy's sake let me be i am in a hurry no no i continued i want you to know that i am going away to-morrow and to promise to love me always you are leaving to-morrow oh that sweet cry and how tenderly babet uttered it i seem still to hear her apprehensive voice full of affliction and love you see i exclaimed in my turn that my uncle lazare said the truth besides he never tells fibs you love me you love me babet your lips this morning confided the secret very softly to my fingers and i made her sit down at the foot of the hedge my memory has retained my first chat of love in its absolute innocence babet listened to me like a little sister she was no longer afraid she told me the story of her love and there were solemn sermons ingenious avowals projects without end she vowed she would marry no one but me i vowed to deserve her hand by labor and tenderness there was a cricket behind the hedge who accompanied our chat with his chaunt of hope and all the valley whispering in the dark took pleasure in hearing us talk so softly on separating we forgot to kiss each other when i returned to my little room it appeared to me that i had left it for at least a year that day which was so short seemed an eternity of happiness it was the warmest and most sweetly scented spring day of my life and the remembrance of it is now like the distant faltering voice of my youth end of jean gourdon's four days part one by emile zola international short stories volume three french stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary international short stories volume three french stories compiled and translated by francis j reynolds jean gourdon's four days part two by emile zola summer when i awoke at about three o'clock in the morning on that particular day i was lying on the hard ground tired out and with my face bathed in perspiration the hot heavy atmosphere of a july night weighed me down my companions were sleeping around me wrapped in their hooded cloaks they speckled the gray ground with black and the obscure plain panted 
i fancied i heard the heavy breathing of a slumbering multitude indistinct sounds the neighing of horses the clash of arms rang out amidst the rustling silence the army had halted at about midnight and we had received orders to lie down and sleep we had been marching for three days scorched by the sun and blinded by dust the enemy were at length in front of us over there on those hills on the horizon at daybreak a decisive battle would be fought i had been a victim to despondency for three days i had been as if trampled on without energy and without thought for the future it was the excessive fatigue indeed that had just awakened me now lying on my back with my eyes wide open i was thinking whilst gazing into the night i thought of this battle this butchery which the sun was about to light up for more than six years at the first shot in each fight i had been saying good-bye to those i loved the most fondly babet and uncle lazare and now barely a month before my discharge i had to say good-bye again and this time perhaps for ever then my thoughts softened with closed eyelids i saw babet and my uncle lazare how long it was since i had kissed them i remembered the day of our separation my uncle weeping because he was poor and allowing me to leave like that and babet in the evening had vowed she would wait for me and that she would never love another i had had to quit all my master at grenoble my friends at dourg a few letters had come from time to time to tell me they always loved me and that happiness was awaiting me in my well-beloved valley and i i was going to fight i was going to get killed i began dreaming of my return i saw my poor old uncle on the threshold of the parsonage extending his trembling arms and behind him was babet quite red smiling through her tears i fell into their arms and kissed them seeking for expressions suddenly the beating of drums recalled me to stern reality daybreak had come the gray plain expanded in the morning mist the ground became full of life indistinct forms appeared on all sides a sound that became louder and louder filled the air it was the call of bugles the galloping of horses the rumble of artillery the shouting out of orders war came threatening amidst my dream of tenderness i rose with difficulty it seemed to me that my bones were broken and that my head was about to split i hastily got my men together for i must tell you that i had won the rank of sergeant we soon received orders to bear to the left and occupy a hillock above the plain as we were about to move the sergeant major came running along and shouting a letter for sergeant gourdon and he handed me a dirty crumpled letter which had been lying perhaps for a week in the leather bags of the post office i had only just time to recognize the writing of my uncle lazare forward march shouted the major i had to march for a few seconds i held the poor letter in my hand devouring it with my eyes it burnt my fingers i would have given everything in the world to have sat down and wept at ease whilst reading it i had to content myself with slipping it under my tunic against my heart i have never experienced such agony by way of consolation i said to myself what my uncle had so often repeated to me i was in the summer of my life at the moment of the fierce struggle and it was essential that i should perform my duty bravely if i would have a peaceful and bountiful autumn but these reasons exasperated me the more this letter which had come to speak to me of happiness burnt my heart which had revolted against the folly of war and i could not even read it i was perhaps going to die without knowing what it contained without perusing my uncle lazare's affectionate remarks for the last time we had reached the top of the hill we were to await orders there to advance the battlefield had been marvellously chosen to slaughter one another at ease the immense plain expanded for several leagues and was quite bare without a house or tree 
hedges and bushes made slight spots on the whiteness of the ground i have never since seen such a country an ocean of dust a chalky soil bursting open here and there and displaying its tawny bowels and never either have i since witnessed a sky of such intense purity a july day so lovely and so warm at eight o'clock the sultry heat was already scorching our faces oh the splendid morning and what a sterile plain to kill and die in firing had broken out with irregular crackling sounds a long time since supported by the solemn growl of the cannon the enemy austrians dressed in white had quitted the heights and the plain was studded with long files of men who looked to me about as big as insects one might have thought it was an ant hill in insurrection clouds of smoke hung over the battlefield at times when these clouds broke asunder i perceived soldiers in flight smitten with terrified panic thus there were currents of fright which bore men away and outbursts of shame and courage which brought them back under fire i could neither hear the cries of the wounded nor see the blood flow i could only distinguish the dead which the battalions left behind them and which resembled black patches i began to watch the movements of the troops with curiosity irritated at the smoke which hid a good half of the show experiencing a sort of egotistic pleasure at the knowledge that i was in security whilst others were dying at about nine o'clock we were ordered to advance we went down the hill at the double and proceeded towards the centre which was giving way the regular beat of our footsteps appeared to me funeral-like the bravest among us panting pale and with haggard features i have made up my mind to tell the truth at the first whistle of the bullets the battalion suddenly came to a halt tempted to fly forward forward shouted the chiefs but we were riveted to the ground bowing our heads when a bullet whistled by our ears this movement is instinctive if shame had not restrained me i would have thrown myself flat on my stomach in the dust before us was a huge veil of smoke which we dared not penetrate red flashes passed through this smoke and shuddering we stood still but the bullets reached us soldiers fell with yells the chiefs shouted louder forward forward the rear ranks which they pushed on compelled us to march then closing our eyes we made a fresh dash and entered the smoke we were seized with furious rage when the cry of halt resounded we experienced difficulty in coming to a standstill as soon as one is motionless fear returns and one feels a wish to run away firing commenced we shot in front of us without aiming finding some relief in discharging bullets into the smoke i remember i pulled my trigger mechanically with lips firmly set together and eyes wide open i was no longer afraid for to tell the truth i no longer knew if i existed the only idea i had in my head was that i would continue firing until all was over my companion on the left received a bullet full in the face and fell on me i brutally pushed him away wiping my cheek which he had drenched with blood and i resumed firing i still remember having seen our colonel monsieur de montrevert firm and erect upon his horse gazing quietly towards the enemy that man appeared to me immense he had no rifle to amuse himself with and his breast was expanded to its full breadth above us from time to time he looked down and exclaimed in a dry voice close the ranks close the ranks we closed our ranks like sheep treading on the dead stupefied and continuing firing until then the enemy had only sent us bullets a dull explosion was heard and a shell carried off five of our men a battery which must have been opposite us and which we could not see had just opened fire 
the shells struck into the middle of us almost at one spot making a sanguinary gap which we closed unceasingly with the obstinacy of ferocious brutes close the ranks close the ranks the colonel coldly repeated we were giving the cannon human flesh each time a soldier was struck down i was taking a step nearer death i was approaching the spot where the shells were falling heavily crushing the men whose turn had come to die the corpses were forming heaps in that place and soon the shells would strike into nothing more than a mound of mangled flesh shreds of limbs flew about at each fresh discharge we could no longer close the ranks the soldiers yelled the chiefs themselves were moved with the bayonet with the bayonet and amidst a shower of bullets the battalion rushed in fury towards the shells the veil of smoke was torn asunder we perceived the enemy's battery flaming red which was firing at us from the mouths of all its pieces on the summit of a hillock but the dash forward had commenced the shells stopped the dead only i ran beside colonel montrevert whose horse had just been killed and who was fighting like a simple soldier suddenly i was struck down it seemed to me as if my breast opened and my shoulder was taken away a frightful wind passed over my face and i fell the colonel fell beside me i felt myself dying i thought of those i loved and fainted whilst searching with a withering hand for my uncle lazare's letter when i came to myself again i was lying on my side in the dust i was annihilated by profound stupor i gazed before me with my eyes wide open without seeing anything it seemed to me that i had lost my limbs and that my brain was empty i did not suffer for life seemed to have departed from my flesh the rays of a hot implacable sun fell upon my face like molten lead i did not feel it life returned to me little by little my limbs became lighter my shoulder alone remained crushed beneath an enormous weight then with the instinct of a wounded animal i wanted to sit up i uttered a cry of pain and fell back upon the ground but i lived now i saw i understood the plain spread out naked and deserted all white in the broad sunlight it exhibited its desolation beneath the intense serenity of heaven heaps of corpses were sleeping in the warmth and the trees that had been brought down seemed to be other dead who were dying there was not a breath of air a frightful silence came from those piles of inanimate bodies then at times there were dismal groans which broke this silence and conveyed a long tremor to it slender clouds of gray smoke hanging over the low hills on the horizon was all that broke the bright blue of the sky the butchery was continuing on the heights i imagined we were conquerors and i experienced selfish pleasure in thinking i could die in peace on this deserted plain around me the earth was black on raising my head i saw the enemy's battery on which we had charged a few feet away from me the struggle must have been horrible the mound was covered with hacked and disfigured bodies blood had flowed so abundantly that the dust seemed like a large red carpet the cannon stretched out their dark muzzles above the corpses i shuddered when i observed the silence of those guns then gently with a multitude of precautions i succeeded in turning on my stomach i rested my head on a large stone all splashed with gore and drew my uncle lazare's letter from my breast i placed it before my eyes but my tears prevented my reading it and whilst the sun was roasting me in the back the acrid smell of blood was choking me i could form an idea of the woeful plain around me and was as if stiffened with the rigidness of the dead 
my poor heart was weeping in the warm and loathsome silence of murder uncle lazar wrote to me my dear boy i hear war has been declared but i still hope you will get your discharge before the campaign opens every morning i beseech the almighty to spare you new dangers he will grant my prayer he will one of these days let you close my eyes ah my poor jean i am becoming old i have great need of your arm since your departure i no more feel your youthfulness beside me which gave me back my twenty summers do you remember our strolls in the morning along the oak tree walk now i no longer dare to go beneath those trees i am alone i am afraid the durance weeps come quickly and console me assuage my anxiety the tears were choking me i could not continue at that moment a heart-rending cry was uttered a few steps away from me i saw a soldier suddenly rise with the muscles of his face contracted he extended his arms in agony and fell to the ground where he writhed in frightful convulsions then he ceased moving i have placed my hope in the almighty continued my uncle he will bring you back safe and sound to durg and we will resume our peaceful existence let me dream out loud and tell you my plans for the future you will go no more to grenoble you will remain with me i will make my child a son of the soil a peasant who shall live gaily whilst tilling the fields and i will retire to your farm in a short time my trembling hands will no longer be able to hold the host i only ask heaven for two years of such an existence that will be my reward for the few good deeds i may have done then you will sometimes lead me along the paths of our dear valley where every rock every hedge will remind me of your youth which i so greatly loved i had to stop again i felt such a sharp pain in my shoulder that i almost fainted a second time a terrible anxiety had just taken possession of me it seemed as if the sound of the fusillade was approaching and i thought with terror that our army was perhaps retreating and that in its flight it would descend to the plain and pass over my body but i still saw nothing but the slight cloud of smoke hanging over the low hills my uncle lazare added and we shall be three to love one another ah my well-beloved jean how right you were to give her to drink that morning beside the durance i was afraid of babet i was ill-humoured and now i am jealous for i can see very well that i shall never be able to love you as much as she does tell him she repeated to me yesterday blushing that if he gets killed i shall go and throw myself into the river at the spot where he gave me to drink for the love of god be careful of your life there are things that i cannot understand but i feel that happiness awaits you here i already call babet my daughter i can see her on your arm in the church when i shall bless your union i wish that to be my last mass babet is a fine tall girl now she will assist you in your work the sound of the fusillade had gone farther away i was weeping sweet tears there were dismal moans among soldiers who were in their last agonies between the cannon wheels i perceived one who was endeavouring to get rid of a comrade wounded as he was whose body was crushing his chest and as this wounded man struggled and complained the soldier pushed him brutally away and made him roll down the slope of the mound whilst the wretched creature yelled with pain at that cry a murmur came from the heap of corpses the sun which was sinking shed rays of a light fallow colour the blue of the sky was softer i finished reading my uncle lazare's letter i simply wished he continued 
to give you news of ourselves and to beg you to come as soon as possible and make us happy and here i am weeping and gossiping like an old child hope my poor jean i pray and god is good answer me quickly and give me if possible the date of your return babet and i are counting the weeks we trust to see you soon be hopeful the date of my return i kissed the letter sobbing and fancied for a moment that i was kissing babet and my uncle no doubt i should never see them again i would die like a dog in the dust beneath the leaden sun and it was on that desolated plain amidst the death-rattle of the dying that those whom i loved dearly were saying good-bye a buzzing silence filled my ears i gazed at the pale earth spotted with blood which extended deserted to the gray lines of the horizon i repeated i must die then i closed my eyes and thought of babet and my uncle lazar i know not how long i remained in a sort of painful drowsiness my heart suffered as much as my flesh warm tears ran slowly down my cheeks amidst the nightmare that accompanied the fever i heard a moan similar to the continuous plaintive cry of a child in suffering at times i awoke and stared at the sky in astonishment at last i understood that it was monsieur de montrevert lying a few paces off who was moaning in this manner i had thought him dead he was stretched out with his face to the ground and his arms extended this man had been good to me i said to myself that i could not allow him to die thus with his face to the ground and i began crawling slowly towards him two corpses separated us for a moment i thought of passing over the stomachs of these dead men to shorten the distance for my shoulder made me suffer frightfully at every movement but i did not dare i proceeded on my knees assisting myself with one hand when i reached the colonel i gave a sigh of relief it seemed to me that i was less alone we would die together and this death shared by both of us no longer terrified me i wanted him to see the sun and i turned him over as gently as possible when the rays fell upon his face he breathed hard he opened his eyes leaning over his body i tried to smile at him he closed his eyelids again i understood by his trembling lips that he was conscious of his sufferings it's you gourdon he said to me at last in a feeble voice is the battle won i think so colonel i answered him there was a moment of silence then opening his eyes and looking at me he inquired where are you wounded in the shoulder and you colonel my elbow must be smashed i remember it was the same bullet that arranged us both like this my boy he made an effort to sit up but come he said with sudden gaiety we are not going to sleep here you cannot believe how much this courageous display of joviality contributed towards giving me strength and hope i felt quite different since we were two to struggle against death wait i exclaimed i will bandage up your arm with my handkerchief and we will try and support one another as far as the nearest ambulance that's it my boy don't make it too tight now let us take each other by the good hand and try to get up we rose staggering we had lost a great deal of blood our heads were swimming and our legs failed us anyone would have mistaken us for drunkards stumbling supporting pushing one another and making zigzags to avoid the dead the sun was setting with a rosy blush and our gigantic shadows danced in a strange way over the field of battle it was the end of a fine day the colonel joked his lips were crisped by shudders his laughter resembled sobs 
i could see that we were going to fall down in some corner never to rise again at times we were seized with giddiness and were obliged to stop and close our eyes the ambulances formed small gray patches on the dark ground at the extremity of the plain we knocked up against a large stone and were thrown down one on the other the colonel swore like a pagan we tried to walk on all fours catching hold of the briars in this way we did a hundred yards on our knees but our knees were bleeding i have had enough of it said the colonel lying down they may come and fetch me if they will let us sleep i still had the strength to sit half up and shout with all the breath that remained within me men were passing along in the distance picking up the wounded they ran to us and placed us side by side on a stretcher comrade the colonel said to me during the journey death will not have us i owe you my life i will pay my debt whenever you have need of me give me your hand i placed my hand in his and it was thus that we reached the ambulances they had lighted torches the surgeons were cutting and sawing amidst frightful yells a sickly smell came from the blood-stained linen whilst the torches cast dark rosy flakes into the basins the colonel bore the amputation of his arm with courage i only saw his lips turn pale and a film come over his eyes when it was my turn a surgeon examined my shoulder a shell did that for you he said an inch lower and your shoulder would have been carried away the flesh only has suffered and when i asked the assistant who was dressing my wound whether it was serious he answered me with a laugh serious you will have to keep to your bed for three weeks and make new blood i turned my face to the wall not wishing to show my tears and with my heart's eyes i perceived babet and my uncle lazare stretching out their arms towards me i had finished with the sanguinary struggles of my summer day end of jean gourdon's four days part two by Emile Zola International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary International Short Stories, Volume 3 french stories compiled and translated by francis j reynolds jean gourdon's four days part three by emile zola autumn it was nearly fifteen years since i had married babet in my uncle lazare's little church we had sought happiness in our dear valley i had made myself a farmer the durance my first sweetheart was now a good mother to me who seemed to take pleasure in making my fields rich and fertile little by little by following the new methods of agriculture i became one of the wealthiest landowners in the neighborhood we had purchased the oak tree walk and the meadows bordering on the river at the death of my wife's parents i had had a modest house built on this land but we were soon obliged to enlarge it each year i found a means of rounding off our property by the addition of some neighboring field and our granaries were too small for our harvests those first fifteen years were uneventful and happy they passed away in serene joy and all they have left within me is the remembrance of calm and continued happiness my uncle lazare on retiring to our home had realized his dream his advanced age did not permit of his reading his breviary of a morning he sometimes regretted his dear church but consoled himself by visiting the young vicar who had succeeded him he came down from the little room he occupied at sunrise and often accompanied me to the fields enjoying himself in the open air and finding a second youth amidst the healthy atmosphere of the country 
one sadness alone made us sometimes sigh amidst the fruitfulness by which we were surrounded babet remained childless although we were three to love one another we sometimes found ourselves too much alone we would have liked to have had a little fair head running about amongst us who would have tormented and caressed us uncle lazare had a frightful dread of dying before he was a great uncle he had become a child again and felt sorrowful that babet did not give him a comrade who would have played with him on the day when my wife confided to us with hesitation that we would no doubt soon be four i saw my uncle turn quite pale and make efforts not to cry he kissed us thinking already of the christening and speaking of the child as if it were already three or four years old and the months passed in concentrated tenderness we talked together in subdued voices awaiting some one i no longer loved babet i worshipped her with joined hands i worshipped her for two for herself and the little one the great day was drawing nigh i had brought a midwife from grenoble who never moved from the farm my uncle was in a dreadful fright he understood nothing about such things he went so far as to tell me that he had done wrong in taking holy orders and that he was very sorry he was not a doctor one morning in september at about six o'clock i went into the room of my dear babet who was still asleep her smiling face was peacefully reposing on the white linen pillow-case i bent over her holding my breath heaven had blessed me with the good things of this world i all at once thought of that summer day when i was moaning in the dust and at the same time i felt around me the comfort due to labor and the quietude that comes from happiness my good wife was asleep all rosy in the middle of her great bed whilst the whole room recalled to me our fifteen years of tender affection i kissed babet softly on the lips she opened her eyes and smiled at me without speaking i felt an almost uncontrollable desire to take her in my arms and clasp her to my heart but latterly i had hardly dared press her hand she seemed so fragile and sacred to me i seated myself at the edge of the bed and asked her in a low voice is it for to-day no i don't think so she replied i dreamt i had a boy he was already very tall and wore adorable little black mustachios uncle lazare told me yesterday that he also had seen him in a dream i acted very stupidly i know the child better than you do i said i see it every night it's a girl and as babet turned her face to the wall ready to cry i realized how foolish i had been and hastened to add when i say a girl i am not quite sure i see a very small child with a long white gown it's certainly a boy babet kissed me for that pleasing remark go and look after the vintage she continued i feel calm this morning you will send for me if anything happens yes yes i am very tired i shall go to sleep again you'll not be angry with me for my laziness and babet closed her eyes looking languid and affected i remained leaning over her receiving the warm breath from her lips in my face she gradually went off to sleep without ceasing to smile then i disengaged my hand from hers with a multitude of precautions i had to manoeuvre for five minutes to bring this delicate task to a happy issue after that i gave her a kiss on her forehead which she did not feel and withdrew with a palpitating heart overflowing with love in the courtyard below i found my uncle lazare who was gazing anxiously at the window of babet's room so soon as he perceived me he inquired well is it for to-day he had been putting this question to me regularly every morning for the past month it appears not i answered him will you come with me and see them picking the grapes he fetched his stick and we went down the oak tree walk when we were at the end of it on that terrace which overlooks the durance 
both of us stopped gazing at the valley small white clouds floated in the pale sky the sun was shedding soft rays which cast a sort of gold dust over the country the yellow expanse of which spread out all ripe one saw neither the brilliant light nor the dark shadows of summer the foliage gilded the black earth in large patches the river ran more slowly weary at the task of having rendered the fields fruitful for a season and the valley remained calm and strong it already wore the first furrows of winter but it preserved within it the warmth of its last labor displaying its robust charms free from the weeds of spring more majestically beautiful like that second youth of woman who has given birth to life my uncle lazare remained silent then turning towards me said do you remember jean it is more than twenty years ago since i brought you here early one may morning on that particular day i showed you the valley full of feverish activity laboring for the fruits of autumn look the valley has just performed its task again i remember dear uncle i replied i was quaking with fear on that day but you were good and your lesson was convincing i owe you all my happiness yes you have reached the autumn you have labored and are gathering in the harvest man my boy was created after the way of the earth and we like the common mother are eternal the green leaves are born again each year from dry leaves i am born again in you and you will be born again in your children i am telling you this so that old age may not alarm you so that you may know how to die in peace as dies this verdure which will shoot out again from its own germs next spring i listened to my uncle and thought of babet who was sleeping in her great bed spread with white linen the dear creature was about to give birth to a child after the manner of this fertile soil which had given us fortune she also had reached the autumn she had the beaming smile and serene robustness of the valley i seemed to see her beneath the yellow sun tired and happy experiencing noble delight at being a mother and i no longer knew whether my uncle lazare was talking to me of my dear valley or of my dear babet we slowly ascended the hills below along the durance were the meadows broad raw green swards next came the yellow fields intersected here and there by grayish olive and slender almond trees planted wide apart in rows then right up above were the vines great stumps with shoots trailing along the ground the vine is treated in the south of france like a hardy housewife and not like a delicate young lady as in the north it grows somewhat as it likes according to the good will of rain and sun the stumps which are planted in double rows and form long lines throw sprays of dark verdure about them wheat or oats are sown between a vineyard resembles an immense piece of striped material made of the green bands formed by the vine leaves and of yellow ribbon represented by the stubble men and women stooping down among the vines were cutting the bunches of grapes which they then threw to the bottom of large baskets my uncle and i walked slowly through the stubble as we passed along the vintagers turned their heads and greeted us my uncle sometimes stopped to speak to some of the oldest of the laborers hey father andre he said are the grapes thoroughly ripe will the wine be good this year and the country folk raising their bare arms displayed the long bunches which were as black as ink in the sun and when the grapes were pressed they seemed to burst with abundance and strength look mr cure they exclaimed these are small ones there are some weighing several pounds we have not had such a task these ten years then they returned among the leaves 
their brown jackets formed patches in the verdure and the women bareheaded with small blue handkerchiefs round their necks were stooping down singing there were children rolling in the sun in the stubble giving utterance to shrill laughter and enlivening this open-air workshop with their turbulency large carts remained motionless at the edge of the field waiting for the grapes they stood out prominently against the clear sky whilst men went and came unceasingly carrying away full baskets and bringing back empty ones i confess that in the centre of this field i had feelings of pride i heard the ground producing beneath my feet ripe age ran all powerful in the veins of the vine and loaded the air with great puffs of it hot blood coursed in my flesh i was as if elevated by the fecundity overflowing from the soil and ascending within me the labor of this swarm of workpeople was my doing these vines were my children this entire farm became my large and obedient family i experienced pleasure in feeling my feet sink into the heavy land then at a glance i took in the fields that sloped down to the durance and i was the possessor of those vines those meadows that stubble those olive trees the house stood all white beside the oak tree walk the river seemed like a fringe of silver placed at the edge of the great green mantle of my pasture land i fancied for a moment that my frame was increasing in size that by stretching out my arms i would be able to embrace the entire property and press it to my breast trees meadows house and ploughed land and as i looked i saw one of our servant girls racing out of breath up the narrow pathway that ascended the hill confused by the speed at which she was travelling she stumbled over the stones agitating both her arms and hailing us with gestures of bewilderment i felt choking with inexpressible emotion uncle uncle i shouted look how marguerite's running i think it must be for to-day my uncle lazare turned quite pale the servant had at length reached the plateau she came towards us jumping over the vines when she reached me she was out of breath she was stifling and pressing her hands to her bosom speak i said to her what has happened she heaved a heavy sigh agitated her hands and finally was able to pronounce this single word madame i waited for no more come come quick uncle lazare ah my poor dear babet and i bounded down the pathway at a pace fit to break my bones the vintagers who had stood up smiled as they saw me running uncle lazare who could not overtake me shook his walking-stick in despair eh jean the deuce he shouted wait for me i don't want to be the last but i no longer heard uncle lazare and continued running i reached the farm panting for breath full of hope and terror i rushed upstairs and knocked with my fist at babet's door laughing crying and half crazy the midwife set the door ajar to tell me in an angry voice not to make so much noise i stood there abashed and in despair you can't come in she added go and wait in the courtyard and as i did not move she continued all is going on very well i will call you the door was closed I remained standing before it, unable to make up my mind to go away. I heard Babet complaining in a broken voice, and while I was there she gave utterance to a heart-rending scream that struck me right in the breast like a bullet. I felt an almost irresistible desire to break the door open with my shoulder. So as not to give way to it, I placed my hands to my ears and dashed downstairs in the courtyard i found my uncle lazare who had just arrived out of breath the worthy man was obliged to seat himself on the brink of the well hello where is the child he inquired of me i don't know i answered they shut the door in my face babet is in pain and in tears we gazed at one another not daring to utter a word 
we listened in agony without taking our eyes off babet's window endeavoring to see through the little white curtains my uncle who was trembling stood still with both his hands resting heavily on his walking-stick i feeling very feverish walked up and down before him taking long strides at times we exchanged anxious smiles the carts of the vintagers arrived one by one the baskets of grapes were placed against a wall of the courtyard and bare-legged men trampled the bunches underfoot in wooden troughs the mules neighed the carters swore whilst the wine fell with a dull sound to the bottom of the vat acrid smells pervaded the warm air and i continued pacing up and down as if made tipsy by those perfumes my poor head was breaking and as i watched the red juice run from the grapes i thought of babet i said to myself with manly joy that my child was born at the prolific time of vintage amidst the perfume of new wine i was tormented by impatience i went upstairs again but i did not dare knock i pressed my ear against the door and heard babet's low moans and sobs then my heart failed me and i cursed suffering uncle lazare who had crept up behind me had to lead me back into the courtyard he wished to divert me and told me the wine would be excellent but he spoke without attending to what he said and at times we were both silent listening anxiously to one of babet's more prolonged moans little by little the cries subsided and became nothing more than a painful murmur like the voice of a child falling off to sleep in tears then there was absolute silence this soon caused me unutterable terror the house seemed empty now that babet had ceased sobbing i was just going upstairs when the midwife opened the window noiselessly she leant out and beckoned me with her hand come she said to me i went slowly upstairs feeling additional delight at each step i took my uncle lazare was already knocking at the door whilst i was only half way up to the landing experiencing a sort of strange delight in delaying the moment when i would kiss my wife i stopped on the threshold my heart was beating double my uncle had leant over the cradle babet quite pale with closed eyelids seemed asleep i forgot all about the child and going straight to babet took her dear hand between mine the tears had not dried on her cheeks and her quivering lips were dripping with them she raised her eyelids wearily she did not speak to me but i understood her to say i have suffered a great deal my dear jean but i was so happy to suffer i felt you within me then i bent down i kissed babet's eyes and drank her tears she laughed with much sweetness she resigned herself with caressing languidness the fatigue had made her all aches and pains she slowly moved her hands from the sheet and taking me by the neck placed her lips to my ear it's a boy she murmured in a weak voice but with an air of triumph those were the first words she uttered after the terrible shock she had undergone i knew it would be a boy she continued i saw the child every night give him me put him beside me i turned round and saw the midwife and my uncle quarrelling the midwife had all the trouble in the world to prevent uncle lazare taking the little one in his arms he wanted to nurse it i looked at the child whom the mother had made me forget he was all rosy babet said with conviction that he was like me the midwife discovered that he had his mother's eyes i for my part could not say i was almost crying i smothered the dear little thing with kisses imagining i was still kissing babet i placed the child on the bed he kept on crying but this sounded to us like celestial music 
i sat on the edge of the bed my uncle took a large armchair and babet weary and serene covered up to her chin remained with open eyelids and smiling eyes the window was wide open the smell of grapes came in along with the warmth of the mild autumn afternoon one heard the trampling of the vintagers the shocks of the carts the cracking of whips at times the shrill song of a servant working in the courtyard reached us all this noise was softened in the serenity of that room which still resounded with babet's sobs and the window frame enclosed a large strip of landscape carved out of the heavens and open country we could see the oak-tree walk in its entire length then the durance looking like a white satin ribbon passed amidst the gold and purple leaves whilst above this square of ground were the limpid depths of a pale sky with blue and rosy tints it was amidst the calm of this horizon amidst the exhalations of the vat and the joys attendant upon labor and reproduction that we three talked together babet uncle lazare and myself whilst gazing at the dear little new-born babe uncle lazare said babet what name will you give the child jean's mother was named jacqueline answered my uncle i shall call the child jacques 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 repeated babet yes it's a pretty name and tell me what shall we make the little man parson or soldier gentleman or peasant i began to laugh we shall have time to think of that i said but no continued babet almost angry he will grow rapidly see how strong he is he already speaks with his eyes my uncle lazare was exactly of my wife's opinion he answered in a very grave tone make him neither priest nor soldier unless he have an irresistible inclination for one of those callings to make him a gentleman would be a serious babet looked at me anxiously the dear creature had not a bit of pride for herself but like all mothers she would have liked to be humble and proud before her son i could have sworn that she already saw him a notary or a doctor i kissed her and gently said to her i wish our son to live in our dear valley one day he will find a babet of sixteen on the banks of the durance to whom he will give some water do you remember my dear the country has brought us peace our son shall be a peasant as we are and happy as we are babet who was quite touched kissed me in her turn she gazed at the foliage and the river the meadows and the sky through the window then she said to me smiling you are right jean this place has been good to us it will be the same to our little jacques uncle lazare you will be the godfather of a farmer uncle lazare made a languid affectionate sign of approval with the head i had been examining him for a moment and saw his eyes becoming filmy and his lips turning pale leaning back in the armchair opposite the window he had placed his white hands on his knees and was watching the heavens fixedly with an expression of thoughtful ecstasy i felt very anxious are you in pain uncle lazare i inquired of him what is the matter with you answer for mercy's sake he gently raised one of his hands as if to beg me to speak lower then he let it fall again and said in a weak voice i am broken down he said happiness at my age is mortal don't make a noise it seems as if my flesh were becoming quite light i can no longer feel my legs or arms babet raised herself in alarm with her eyes on uncle lazare i knelt down before him watching him anxiously he smiled don't be frightened he resumed i am in no pain 
a feeling of calmness is gaining possession of me i believe i am going off into a good and just sleep it came over me all at once and i thank the almighty ah my poor jean i ran too fast down the pathway on the hillside the child caused me too great joy and as we understood we burst out into tears uncle lazare continued without ceasing to watch the sky do not spoil my joy i beg of you if you only knew how happy it makes me to fall asleep for ever in this armchair i have never dared expect such a consoling death all i love is here beside me and see what a blue sky the almighty has sent a lovely evening the sun was sinking behind the oak tree walk its slanting rays cast sheets of gold beneath the trees which took the tones of old copper the verdant fields melted into vague serenity in the distance uncle lazare became weaker and weaker amidst the touching silence of this peaceful sunset entering by the open window he slowly passed away like those slight gleams that were dying out on the lofty branches ah my good valley he murmured you are sending me a tender farewell i was afraid of coming to my end in the winter when you would be all black we restrained our tears not wishing to trouble this saintly death babet prayed in an undertone the child continued uttering smothered cries my uncle lazare heard its wail in the dreaminess of his agony he endeavored to turn towards babet and still smiling said i have seen the child and die very happy then he gazed at the pale sky and yellow fields and throwing back his head heaved a gentle sigh no tremor agitated uncle lazare's body he died as one falls asleep we had become so calm that we remained silent and with dry eyes in the presence of such great simplicity in death all we experienced was a feeling of serene sadness twilight had set in uncle lazare's farewell had left us confident like the farewell of the sun which dies at night to be born again in the morning such was my autumn day which gave me a son and carried off my uncle lazare in the peacefulness of the twilight end of jean gourdon's four days part three by emile zola International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories, compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. Jean Gourdon's Four Days, Part 4 by emile zola winter there are dreadful mornings in january that chill one's heart i awoke on this particular day with a vague feeling of anxiety it had thawed during the night and when i cast my eyes over the country from the threshold it looked to me like an immense dirty gray rag soiled with mud and rent to tatters the horizon was shrouded in a curtain of fog in which the oak trees along the walk lugubriously extended their dark arms like a row of spectres guarding the vast mass of vapor spreading out behind them the fields had sunk and were covered with great sheets of water at the edge of which hung the remnants of dirty snow the loud roar of the durance was increasing in the distance winter imparts health and strength to one's frame when the sun is clear and the ground dry 
the air makes the tips of your ears tingle you walk merrily along the frozen pathways which ring with a silvery sound beneath your tread but i know of nothing more saddening than dull thawing weather i hate the damp fogs which weigh one's shoulders down i shivered in the presence of that copper-like sky and hastened to retire indoors making up my mind that i would not go out into the fields that day there was plenty of work in and around the farm buildings jacques had been up a long time i heard him whistling in a shed where he was helping some men remove sacks of corn the boy was already eighteen years old he was a tall fellow with strong arms he had not had an uncle lazare to spoil him and teach him latin and he did not go and dream beneath the willows at the riverside jacques had become a real peasant an untiring worker who got angry when i touched anything telling me i was getting old and ought to rest and as i was watching him from a distance a sweet lithe creature leaping on my shoulders clapped her little hands to my eyes inquiring who is it i laughed and answered it's little marie who has just been dressed by her mamma the dear little girl was completing her tenth year and for ten years she had been the delight of the farm having come the last at a time when we could no longer hope to have any more children she was doubly loved her precarious health made her particularly dear to us she was treated as a young lady her mother absolutely wanted to make a lady of her and i had not the heart to oppose her wish so little marie was a pet in lovely silk skirts trimmed with ribbons marie was still seated on my shoulders mamma mamma she cried come and look i'm playing at horses babet who was entering smiled ah my poor babet how old we were i remember we were shivering with weariness on that day gazing sadly at one another when alone our children brought back our youth lunch was eaten in silence we had been compelled to light the lamp the reddish glimmer that hung round the room was sad enough to drive one crazy bah said jacques this tepid rainy weather is better than intense cold that would freeze our vines and olives and he tried to joke but he was as anxious as we were without knowing why babet had had bad dreams we listened to the account of her nightmare laughing with our lips but sad at heart this weather quite upsets one i said to cheer us all up yes yes it's the weather jacques hastened to add i'll put some vine branches on the fire there was a bright flame which cast large sheets of light upon the walls the branches burnt with a cracking sound leaving rosy ashes we had seated ourselves in front of the chimney the air outside was tepid but great drops of icy cold damp fell from the ceilings inside the farmhouse babet had taken little marie on her knees she was talking to her in an undertone amused at her childish chatter are you coming father jacques inquired of me we are going to look at the cellars and lofts i went out with him the harvests had been getting bad for some years past we were suffering great losses our vines and trees were caught by frost whilst hail had chopped up our wheat and oats and i sometimes said that i was growing old and that fortune who is a woman does not care for old men jacques laughed answering that he was young and was going to court fortune i had reached the winter the cold season i felt distinctly that all was withering around me at each pleasure that departed i thought of uncle lazare who had died so calmly and with fond remembrances of him asked for strength daylight had completely disappeared at three o'clock we went down into the common room babet was sewing in the chimney corner with her head bent over her work and little marie was seated on the ground in front of the fire gravely dressing a doll jacques and i had placed ourselves at a mahogany writing-table which had come to us from uncle lazare 
and were engaged in checking our accounts the window was as if blocked up the fog sticking to the panes of glass formed a perfect wall of gloom behind this wall stretched emptiness the unknown a great noise a loud roar alone arose in the silence and spread through the obscurity we had dismissed the workpeople keeping only our old woman servant marguerite with us when i raised my head and listened it seemed to me that the farmhouse hung suspended in the middle of a chasm no human sound came from the outside i heard naught but the riot of the abyss then i gazed at my wife and children and experienced the cowardice of those old people who feel themselves too weak to protect those surrounding them against unknown peril the noise became harsher and it seemed to us that there was a knocking at the door at the same instant the horses in the stable began to neigh furiously whilst the cattle lowed as if choking we had all risen pale with anxiety jacques dashed to the door and threw it wide open a wave of muddy water burst into the room the durance was overflowing it was it that had been making the noise that had been increasing in the distance since morning the snow melting on the mountains had transformed each hillside into a torrent which had swelled the river the curtain of fog had hidden from us this sudden rise of water it had often advanced thus to the gates of the farm when the thaw came after severe winters but the flood had never increased so rapidly we could see through the open door that the courtyard was transformed into a lake the water already reached our ankles babet had caught up little marie who was crying and clasping her doll to her jacques wanted to run and open the doors of the stables and cowhouses but his mother held him back by his clothes begging him not to go out the water continued rising i pushed babet towards the staircase quick quick let us go up into the bedrooms i cried and i obliged jacques to pass before me i left the ground floor the last marguerite came down in terror from the loft where she happened to find herself i made her sit down at the end of the room beside babet who remained silent pale and with beseeching eyes we put little marie into bed she had insisted on keeping her doll and went quietly to sleep pressing it in her arms this child's sleep relieved me when i turned round and saw babet listening to the little girl's regular breathing i forgot the danger all i heard was the water beating against the walls but jacques and i could not help looking peril in the face anxiety made us endeavour to discover the progress of the inundation we had thrown the window wide open we leant out at the risk of falling searching into the darkness the fog which was thicker hung above the flood throwing out fine rain which gave us the shivers vague steel-like flashes were all that showed the moving sheet of water amidst the profound obscurity below it was splashing in the courtyard rising along the walls in gentle undulations and we still heard naught but the anger of the durance and the affrighted cattle and horses the neighing and lowing of these poor beasts pierced me to the heart jacques questioned me with his eyes he would have liked to try and deliver them their agonizing moans soon became lamentable and a great cracking sound was heard the oxen had just broken down the stable doors we saw them pass before us borne away by the flood rolled over and over in the current and they disappeared amid the roar of the river then i felt choking with anger i became as one possessed i shook my fist at the durance erect facing the window i insulted it wicked thing i shouted amidst the tumult of the waters i loved you fondly you were my first sweetheart and now you are plundering me you come and disturb my farm and carry off my cattle ah cursed cursed thing 
then you gave me babet you ran gently at the edge of my meadows i took you for a good mother i remembered uncle lazare felt affection for your limpid stream and i thought i owed you gratitude you are a barbarous mother i only owe you my hatred but the Gironde stifled my cries with its thundering voice and broad and indifferent expanded and drove its flood onward with tranquil obstinacy i turned back to the room and went and kissed babet who was weeping little marie was smiling in her sleep don't be afraid i said to my wife the water cannot always rise it will certainly go down there is no danger no there is no danger jacques repeated feverishly the house is solid at that moment marguerite who had approached the window tormented by that feeling of curiosity which is the outcome of fear leant forward like a mad thing and fell uttering a cry i threw myself before the window but could not prevent jacques plunging into the water marguerite had nursed him and he felt the tenderness of a son for the poor old woman babet had risen in terror with joined hands at the sound of the two splashes she remained there erect with open mouth and distended eyes watching the window i had seated myself on the wooden handrail and my ears were ringing with the roar of the flood i do not know how long it was that babet and i were in this painful state of stupor when a voice called to me it was jacques who was holding on to the wall beneath the window i stretched out my hand to him and he clambered up babet clasped him in her arms she could sob now and she relieved herself no reference was made to marguerite jacques did not dare say he had been unable to find her and we did not dare question him anent his search he took me apart and brought me back to the window father he said to me in an undertone there are more than seven feet of water in the courtyard and the river is still rising we cannot remain here any longer jacques was right the house was falling to pieces the planks of the outbuildings were going away one by one then this death of marguerite weighed upon us babet bewildered was beseeching us marie alone remained peaceful in the big bed with her doll between her arms and slumbering with the happy smile of an angel the peril increased at every minute the water was on the point of reaching the handrail of the window and pouring into the room any one would have said that it was an engine of war making the farmhouse totter with regular dull hard blows the current must be running right against the facade and we could not hope for any human assistance every minute is precious said jacques in agony we shall be crushed beneath the ruins let us look for boards let us make a raft he said that in his excitement i would naturally have preferred a thousand times to be in the middle of the river on a few beams lashed together than beneath the roof of this house which was about to fall in but where could we lay hands on the beams we required in a rage i tore the planks from the cupboards jacques broke the furniture we took away the shutters every piece of wood we could reach and feeling it was impossible to utilize these fragments we cast them into the middle of the room in a fury and continued searching our last hope was departing we understood our misery and want of power the river was rising the harsh voice of the durance was calling to us in anger then i burst out sobbing i took babet in my trembling arms i begged jacques to come near us i wished us all to die in the same embrace jacques had returned to the window and suddenly he exclaimed father we are saved come and see the sky was clear the roof of a shed torn away by the current had come to a standstill beneath our window this roof which was several yards broad was formed of light beams and thatch it floated and would make a capital raft i joined my hands together and would have worshipped this wood and straw jacques jumped on the roof after having firmly secured it 
he walked on the thatch making sure it was everywhere strong the thatch resisted therefore we could adventure on it without fear oh it will carry us all very well said jacques joyfully see how little it sinks into the water the difficulty will be to steer it he looked around him and seized two poles drifting along in the current as they passed by ah here are oars he continued you will go to the stern father and i forward and we will manoeuvre the raft easily there are not twelve feet of water quick quick get on board we must not lose a minute my poor babet tried to smile she wrapped little marie carefully up in her shawl the child had just woke up and quite alarmed maintained a silence which was broken by deep sobs i placed a chair before the window and made babet get on the raft as i held her in my arms i kissed her with poignant emotion feeling this kiss was the last the water was beginning to pour into the room our feet were soaking i was the last to embark then i undid the cord the current hurled us against the wall it required precautions and many efforts to quit the farmhouse the fog had little by little dispersed it was about midnight when we left the stars were still buried in mist the moon which was almost at the edge of the horizon lit up the night with a sort of wan daylight the inundation then appeared to us in all its grandiose horror the valley had become a river the durance swollen to enormous proportions and washing the two hillsides passed between dark masses of cultivated land and was the sole thing displaying life in the inanimate space bounded by the horizon it thundered with a sovereign voice maintaining in its anger the majesty of its colossal wave clumps of trees emerged in places staining the sheet of pale water with black streaks opposite us i recognized the tops of the oaks along the walk the current carried us towards these branches which for us were so many wreaths around the raft floated various kinds of remains pieces of wood empty barrels bundles of grass the river was bearing along the ruins it had made in its anger to the left we perceived the lights of durg flashes of lanterns moving about in the darkness the water could not have risen as high as the village only the low land had been submerged no doubt assistance would come we searched the patches of light hanging over the water it seemed to us at every instant that we heard the sound of oars we had started at random as soon as the raft was in the middle of the current lost amidst the whirlpools of the river anguish of mind overtook us again we almost regretted having left the farm i sometimes turned round and gazed at the house which still remained standing presenting a gray aspect on the white water babet crouching down in the centre of the raft in the thatch of the roof was holding little marie on her knees the child's head against her breast to hide the horror of the river from her both were bent double leaning forward in an embrace as if reduced in stature by fear jacques standing upright in the front was leaning on his pole with all his weight from time to time he cast a rapid glance towards us and then silently resumed his task i seconded him as well as i could but our efforts to reach the bank remained fruitless little by little notwithstanding our poles which we buried into the mud until we nearly broke them we drifted into the open a force that seemed to come from the depths of the water drove us away the durance was slowly taking possession of us struggling bathed in perspiration we had worked ourselves into a passion we were fighting with the river as with a living being seeking to vanquish wound kill it it strained us in its giant-like arms and our poles in our hands became weapons which we thrust into its breast it roared flung its slaver into our faces wriggled beneath our strokes we resisted its victory with clenched teeth we would not be conquered 
and we had mad impulses to fell the monster to calm it with blows from our fists we went slowly towards the offing we were already at the entrance to the oak tree walk the dark branches pierced through the water which they tore with a lamentable sound death perhaps awaited us there in a collision i cried it to jacques to follow the walk by clinging close to the branches and it was thus that i passed for the last time in the middle of this oak tree alley where i had walked in my youth and ripe age in the terrible darkness above the howling depth i thought of uncle lazar and saw the happy days of my youth smiling at me sadly the durance triumphed at the end of the alley our poles no longer touched the bottom the water bore us along in its impetuous bound of victory and now it could do what it pleased with us we gave ourselves up we went downstream with frightful rapidity great clouds dirty tattered rags hung about the sky when the moon was hidden there came lugubrious obscurity then we rolled in chaos enormous billows as black as ink resembling the backs of fish bore us along spinning us round i could no longer see either babet or the children i already felt myself dying i know not how long this last run lasted the moon was suddenly unveiled and the horizon became clear and in that light i perceived an immense black mass in front of us which blocked the way and towards which we were being carried with all the violence of the current we were lost we would be broken there babet had stood upright she held out little marie to me take the child she exclaimed leave me alone leave me alone jacques had already caught babet in his arms in a loud voice he said father save the little one i will save mother we had come close to the black mass i thought i recognized a tree the shock was terrible and the raft split in two scattered its straw and beams in the whirlpool of water i fell clasping little marie tightly to me the icy cold water brought back all my courage on rising to the surface of the river i supported the child i half laid her on my neck and began to swim laboriously if the little creature had not lost consciousness but had struggled we should both have remained at the bottom of the deep and whilst i swam i felt choking with anxiety i called jacques i tried to see in the distance but i heard nothing save the roar of the waters i saw naught but the pale sheet of the durance jacques and babet were at the bottom she must have clung to him dragged him down in a deadly strain of her arms what frightful agony i wanted to die i sunk slowly i was going to find them beneath the black water and as soon as the flood touched little marie's face i struggled again with impetuous anguish to get near the water's side it was thus that i abandoned babet and jacques in despair at having been unable to die with them still calling out to them in a husky voice the river cast me on the stones like one of those bundles of grass it leaves on its way when i came to myself again i took my daughter who was opening her eyes in my arms day was breaking my winter night was at an end that terrible night which had been an accomplice in the murder of my wife and son at this moment after years of regret one last consolation remains to me i am the icy winter but i feel the approaching spring stirring within me as my uncle lazar said we never die i have had four seasons and here i am returning to the spring there is my dear marie commencing the everlasting joys and sorrows over again End of Jean Gourdon's Four Days, Part 4 by Emile Zola